So good afternoon, Executive Director of the Malaysia Australia Business Council, the MABC. I will be moderating today's session and I would like to welcome one and all to this webinar. The topic today is environmental, social and governance policies, otherwise known as ESG, that Malaysian businesses must accept as a necessity if we are to continue doing business. Since 2020, we have seen a marked increase in ESG reporting worldwide, partly in response to increasing scrutiny on companies' social and environmental impacts. This is where ESG commitments have become imperative in doing business. It took a virus, COVID-19, to teach us that sustainability is not just about tackling pure environmental factors, but that it's about creating resilience in the corporate infrastructure. This is where ESG comes into play. I'm honored today to introduce our three panelists in order of presentation, who will wow you with their level of knowledge on the topic of ESG and why we need to embrace it. Starting off with Mr. Girish Ramachandran, who is the co-founder and executive director of 27 Group, a network of consulting firms offering business solutions in strategy, financial, and program management. He has 24 years of corporate experience, including working in ASEAN and specifically in Malaysian nation building projects through positional assessments, such as feasibility studies, business reviews and strategy exercises. Grace will be speaking on public sector governance transformation in Malaysia. Mr. Andrew Young, our second speaker, is the founder and managing director of Enviro Solutions and Consulting ESC. Andrew has been working with the Asian environmental industry for 27 years and is an environmental specialist in industry, government, and consulting organizations. He has advised on environment, health, and safety, EHS, risks to government and private corporations in Asia, Australia, New Zealand, the UK, and Germany. Andrew will be speaking on how strong ESG links to value creation in five essential ways. Our final speaker, Mr. M. R. Chandran, is the chairman of Irga Sindran Berhad, an agri-tech enabler corporation, providing modernization techniques to Malaysia's agricultural sector. He is a doyen of the agro-commodity industry with 60 years, yes, that's six zero years, of professional experience. Mr. Chandran was a key player in the formation of the Roundtable on Sustainable Palm Oil, the RSPO, and holds consultancy positions in various government and private sector think tanks. Mr. Chandran will be speaking on sustainability threats for the Malaysian agricultural industry. Ladies and gentlemen, a few administrative details. The Q&A session will commence only after all three panelists have spoken. Please upload your questions onto the chat box and I will get the relevant speaker or speakers to answer them. Please keep your questions to the topic and as succinct as possible. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, I introduce our first speaker, Mr. Girish Ramachandran. Thank you, Ramesh, and uh, thank you, Malaysia Australia Business Council, for um, inviting me to um, speak on this extremely important subject of ESG. Um, I think uh, the the focus of my presentation um, would be around uh, where Malaysia is, and more importantly. Um, the topic of uh, the G and governance. And, and I think I'm gonna sort of give a different overview, focusing a lot around public sector governance and where we are. The reason why I think this is an important uh, angle for us to understand is, I think it, it all starts with uh, policy when we're talking about ESG and, and uh, it's, it's probably the most important three letters right now, whether you are a corporate or whether you're a public sector organization. And uh, I think it's, it's a lot about educating um, the corporates as well as uh, the, the, the public sector personnel. Um, we did a little bit of work around uh, Malaysia's uh, policy framework. Um, we did some work around the fourth industrial uh, policy in terms of technology. We've also done quite a bit of uh, what we call the master plans around uh, cities and, and corridors. And uh, we've got a lot of data around where Malaysia is 
And uh, we think um, one of the reasons that uh, ESG is going to be extremely crucial for Malaysia's bouncing back post-COVID is because investors are actually going to track ESG. And if we do not have a clear understanding and link our policies towards ESG, um, we may not uh, have those investments coming into Malaysia, which is extremely important for the recovery as well as increasing income and jobs. Next slide. Can we have the next slide, please? Yep. So uh, a little bit of, uh, for those who are not familiar with what ESG is, um, we have the FTSE Russell ESG ratings, which basically looks at 300 different individual indicators. Um, and uh, you've got environment, you've got social, and you've got governance. And basically, there are uh, pillars around uh, uh, the risk and how they are scored, as well as going into much more detailed team goals, for example, health and safety, uh, pollution and resources, climate change, uh, tax transparency, and so on. So it's essentially around um, having a sort of a scorecard around your company um, and, and understanding how the lens of these components cuts across your, your issues and the way you, you run your business as well as how you impact uh, everyone out there. So I'm gonna be focusing on the governance side. Um, next slide, please. And uh, what I would be probably throwing out at the beginning is, is ESG important? Now, this is actually an analysis of uh, the S&P 500, which are based on ESG, which is the orange bar, and the red bar, basically the non-ESGs. We can see that in the last uh, 10 years, it has outperformed a little bit, a little bit. It has outperformed a little bit. But looking at more recent 12 months, we've seen this gap growing wider and wider. And, and companies that are, are ESG rated in, and higher grade ESGs are doing far better from pure stock price annualized returns. Um, if we also look at the last uh, 18 months, we've saw this tremendous spike in the environmental uh, companies. And, and this is something that we, we're starting to see a major shift happening across the world and more importantly in Asia and Southeast Asia. Now, locally, we, we are quite far behind in terms of um, having, having the assessments done and having enough information for us to be able to come up with our own uh, rankings. But they are 76 uh, of the 933 listed companies in Malaysia which are actually on the FTSC for good uh, index. And uh, of the 76, we have basically uh, one with the ESG band two. There are 24 at band three and 51 companies with band four. There are none on band five. And uh, there's also very limited uh, information for people to be able to do these assessments uh, independently and, and using uh, data that is available readily. So we're a long way ahead on this journey, but um, there are essentially um, uh, a lot of thinking behind this, especially from Bursa, who's been ad advocating uh, the whole ESG movement, especially in the last 12 months. Next slide, please. Can we have the next slide? No. Okay. So we've seen a couple of commentaries, uh, like I mentioned, Bursa fully committed towards the whole sustainability agenda. Um, CGS, CIMB has also been uh, talking heavily around the level of scrutiny that investors are now paying, um, especially for large cap companies. Uh, they, they just do not have the ability or, or uh, uh, the necessity to drop on any of these indicators. Um, we've also seen uh, EPF coming very strongly out there to talk heavily around how their ESG ranked uh, portfolios have actually done better uh, than the others. And more importantly, um, in 2020, this, this was probably accelerated as well. Um, next. 
So we, we, we had a little bit of look at uh, let, uh, horizon of 10 years, and this is some analysis that was done by McKinsey around uh, 2009 and 2019 in terms of uh, perception, what, what the business owners feel. Um, the good news is um, all the indicators have actually grown um, even up to 20, 25% points uh, over a, a perception. And this was essentially asking questions around environment, social and governance as to in, the, the importance in relation to shareholder value. And, and uh, this actually came from the business owners. And uh, we think the, the importance is actually moving uh, higher. Now, the interesting thing to note here is the, the one that actually moved a lot was actually the social uh, programs, which is the S. And this is crucial. I think we've seen what COVID has done, especially in the last uh, 18 months. People have re rehashed their business models. They've rehashed their uh, own personal goals. Um, we see a lot of people uh, getting closer to nature. We see a lot of people rethinking about, you know, how, how they move around, whether they need, you know, uh, uh, five cars or three cars or two cars. And this is starting to affect the way uh, consumer habits are moving. And likewise, it's going to affect the businesses and governments. Next slide, please. Um, so when we look at the, the governance part of ESG, there are essentially four themes, uh, tax transparency, uh, risk management, corporate governance, and anti-corruption. Um, we, we find that uh, there is a significant uh, relevance of these four in Malaysia right now. And uh, I'll, I'll probably talk a little bit more around, the, of course, the anti-corruption and a bit around uh, some of the governance and tax transparency. Um, I won't go too much into the risk uh, aspect and leave that probably for another session. Next slide, please. So in governance, essentially, there are about 125 different indicators that are used to assess um, everything from a broad uh, aspect of uh, political, public, uh, corporate sectors, as well as looking at uh, control mechanisms that support national institutions in their goals. And how, how does all of this get uh, implemented with uh, usage of public funds and impacting social development? So a couple of definitions here in governance uh, that are there, they, they all touch around, along socioeconomics, uh, which is essentially looking at uh, the social and economic resources for development. And how do we actually make important decisions that impact uh, socioeconomics? Next slide, please. Um, so Malaysia actually had uh, a couple of plans which we managed to pull out which relate to public sector governance. Um, in 2004, there was a national integrity plan, um, which was right up to 2008, uh, which talked about uh, corruption, it talked about the governance side, it talked about strengthening family institution. But the one that we saw actually uh, moved the needle was actually the GDP and the GDP 2.0 in 2010 and 2012. And they're very extensive uh, uh, planning documents that actually went into some institutional reforms that were done. Um, unfortunately, after the GDP 2 um, from 2015, there's sort of a complete decline in, in statistics, and I'll show you some numbers which looked at uh, a sort of a, a reversal of a lot of um, things that were done on, on good governance and looking at, at G. Um, in 2019, the Pakatan Harapan government actually released the National Anti-Corruption Plan, which stems up to 2023. And uh, there were a couple of things that were identified in there. Uh, of course, we've had uh, political changes and, and, and a recent one as well. So I believe a lot of this comes back to policy. And this is going to be very important for us to make sure that the policies are in place. And like I mentioned earlier, it impacts everything else right down to corporate sector. So it starts with the public sector governance. Next slide. Um, we, we then looked at a little bit of the outcomes that were set out in the Levin Malaysia plan. There was a very extensive chapter on transformation in public sector. And they identified uh, six outcomes and they also looked at several targets. Now, in terms of uh, community expectations on the authority, KPIs, public sector uh, 
comparator, flexible working arrangements, comprehensive audits across institutions, um, having the whole uh, customs, the whole U customs, which is a, which is a solution that allows uh, easier movement of uh, single window platforms, as well as uh, data sharing, uh, these initiatives appear to be on track. However, if we look at the laggard indicators, you can see um, the first one was essentially looking at government efficiency. And this was measured by the World Competitive uh, Nest Yearbook. Uh, the target was actually to be top 10. I think uh, in 2017, we were around 25, probably around the same or worse. Um, the other one was looking at uh, online service. And this was essentially around the whole e-government and making sure that uh, systems and digitalization is very, very strong. Um, we had a target of being top 15. I think we're somewhere around number 40 out of 193 countries, um, which, which to me is not, not the best place to be in. Um, of course, the, the, the key, key indicator which really didn't move, in fact, it probably moved the other way around was corruption. Uh, number 62 out of 180 countries and, and this was based on Transparency International's uh, index. Now the target for that was also top 30, which to me is not a great target. I think the target should be at least in the top 15. Um, so, so we have a lot of work to do on, on some of these areas and, and we can imagine um, what needs to happen next. Next slide, please. So in terms of effectiveness, uh, we managed to pull uh, some comparisons uh, from the global economy, which is actually a, company, a country comparator that looked at three things. Uh, the overall effectiveness of uh, the government, which is put into an index. And uh, you can see, you can see from the numbers that uh, there was uh, uh, an improvement from 2012 right up to 2014. And then from 2014 right down to 2017, it just came down significantly. Um, and we've also seen a downtrend from 2018 to 19, and I, I would imagine um, 2020 around that same trend. Uh, the other one is control of corruption. Um, from 2014 right down to 2017, we saw the downtrend as well, and a further downtrend on the regulatory quality as well. Um, so, so not looking too good in terms of um, how, how we sort of uh, measure where Malaysia is right now. Next slide. And uh, if, we, if we look at the broader performance in terms of competitiveness, and, and I think this is extremely important for us to link the, the, these indicators to the overall ESG and the public sector governance. So the ones I want to talk about are international investments. Um, we, have, we have actually gone 13 paces behind from 22 to 35 for international investments. We've also uh, business legislation, which is very surprising. We've actually uh, gone down 13 indicators from 36 to 49. And labor market, labor market, which I believe uh, Mr. Chandran will be talking heavily around a bit later, um, slipped 16 points from number seven to number 23. And finance, uh, 10 points down and attitudes and value 14 points down. So I think, I think we've got uh, some, some major work to do. And mind you, this is between 2019 and 2020. It also compares other uh, sort of uh, uh, indices and other countries. So it doesn't mean that it's, it's, it's ranking Malaysia on its own. Next slide, please. So, so what we feel um, when we looked at the governance, there were four, four aspects, and one of it is tax transparency. Um, so there was, uh, there was essentially a lot of discussion around uh, Malaysia's revenue base from a tax perspective. And this is one of the concerns that we've seen, where 17% of GDP is essentially uh, where the revenue collected, which which essentially goes back into the tax systems, into uh, public sector expenditure and so on. For upper middle income countries, it's about 28% and high income countries, 36%. So I think, I think we've got that whole revenue part of the business model that needs to be restructured uh, urgently. 
Uh, having said that, we, we are not the cheapest tax, corporate tax rate uh, com countries out there. Singapore is much lower than us and other countries as well. So what we really need to do is probably relook at that whole tax system and who's actually uh, paying into the revenue systems for us to be able to have our top line. Without the top line, it's very difficult to go down and do anything. The other thing was on the social safety nets. And generally, there, there has been some, some analysis that has come out saying the B20 actually only enjoyed 30% of the overall programs that were announced. And, and, and uh, this was in 2019 numbers, um, where, where most of the social transfers impacted the M40 and the T20. And I do believe now even the B40 now is moving into a B50 if we, if we follow the household income rates. Um, the other aspect is, of course, the whole uh, Gini coefficient, which, which is around the, the, the disproportionateness uh, of household incomes. And, uh, you know, things like fuel subsidies, the effectiveness of subsidies have just not been what it should have been. Next slide. Um, so other than that, um, there has been a significant amount of discussion around the, the other component of governance in ESG, which is on corruption. And some of the things that uh, is in the anti-corruption uh, plan of 2023 is actually uh, nine components. Interference of politicians in government administration and finance, uh, light punishment to corruption of offenders, uh, limited adoption of technology, I think a lot of countries are using a lot of technology to, to get away from this, um, including uh, going cashless, including uh, looking at systems that can uh, bypass uh, uh, middlemen or people who are uh, 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 taking uh, uh, economies that are not seen officially. Um, you also see uh, political will and lack of leadership, as we've seen, you know, the government has changed three, four times in the last five years. We, we, we see, uh, you know, different factions. So this has caused even more uh, pressure on trying to get a lot of these policies in place. Um, the other one is, of course, uh, uh, lack of public support and confidence. I think that's something that's deteriorated. Um, and of course, enforcement and monitoring. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so this is a sort of a snapshot of the anti-corruption plan, and it talks about uh, the political governance and law enforcement, um, the judicial and uh, legal review, and public procurement. Um, in our opinion, I, I think because of the various changes, I'm not sure how far this plan has actually been implemented, but it will be good to look at a review in 2024 and see what, what happened. Next slide. So just to wrap up, um, I think, I think uh, ADB, ADB actually had a very interesting uh, study that they did in 2013 and 2015. And one of the things that I thought was uh, quite crucial for Malaysia was this word decentralization. And I think some of those things that we, we tend to see in policy is essentially where federal government tends to drive a lot of the policies. And those policies don't necessarily get cascaded to state level and uh, district level and local levels. And this is extremely important because we, we need to make sure that the development and, and our progress is inclusive across the whole of Malaysia. And, and decentralization is something that we, we started to see, especially in the last two to three years, where certain states are a little bit more uh, aggressive, driving their own policies getting their own uh, uh, funding in place rather than relying on federal government uh, uh, handouts and so on. So we think there could be a very strong uh, decentralization strategy for Malaysia, which, uh, which actually would, would be around the governance policies uh, that would help budgets to, to, to come down to the ground and, and make sure that you know, even local uh, district uh, councils and city councillors have enough money to to make sure that their cities are, are clean, safe, and uh, you know, management of roads and so on. Uh, next slide. The other, the other conclusion which we uh, found was, uh, can, can we have the next slide please? Was basically uh, from World Bank. Uh, and World Bank essentially had a, a very interesting angle here. 
Now their, their solution for, for this was around digitalization and automation of government services to boost efficiency in service delivery and transparency, which, which is fantastic. Uh, we all love to have our, you know, our passports uh, ready in one hour rather than waiting for two weeks. Um, we, we, we love to see uh, you know, buses and, and trains that come on time and so on. And all of this starts back with the automation and digitalization with uh, having data. The other one was essentially around data sharing. And, and we have seen amongst the 728 government agencies and bodies, they, they tend to work a little bit in silos and this needs to be democratized. The data needs to be captured across everyone and it needs to be shared. Without data, we would never be able to have that ability to take information and move to the next level. And the final one was around the human resource management system to be essentially more transparent, uh, more flexible and competency based. So these were the three things that were identified by World Bank. Um, and, and I thought it was, it was quite apt because uh, if you look at Malaysia's plans moving forward, there's a lot of focus around uh, technology and digitalization. There's a lot of focus around uh, upskilling and reskilling. And, and this is where we need to emphasize more policies on. Uh, next slide. So my last slide is essentially around uh, a methodology which we use at uh, 27 Group. And we, we break down uh, public sector, uh, you can even use it for corporates, uh, into three sort of levels when we're looking at implementing um, wide scale change or transformation. The first is actually policy, which is done at a portfolio level. And here we'll be looking at investment, business risk and resources to have master schedules to have uh, things like the statement of needs. And this essentially gives us the, the overall arcing policy. Now in, in public sector aspects, we do think the policy is required to be driven by the public sector and that's crucial. The second level are more around processes and systems which are the program level. And the programs are a combination of private sector and public sector. They will look at cost, they look at benefit, they look at risk, business case, and, and uh, essentially get the processes and systems in place. And the final aspects are projects. Now, projects are actually right down to the ground where we're looking at time, cost, quality, and, and essentially this should be very much majority driven by private sector. And we feel when we look at the governance model, um, where we're talking about risk, you know, we're talking about tax, we're talking about governance, corruption. It is extremely important to have our understanding of policy, program, and projects, and who drives what. A lot of times we tend to see projects that fail because government or, or government linked uh, companies are involved in projects which provides conflicts to private sector and so on. So I think it starts with getting this right. And, and we've, we've been applying this principle in some of the work we've been doing in the last seven years. And it started to have some good uh, traction. So with that, I'll, I'll end my uh, uh, presentation and uh, take any questions later. Uh, thank you very much. And over back to you, Ramesh. Thank you, Mr. Grace Ramachandran. The excellent discourse on transforming the public sector governance in uh, Malaysia. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we move on to our second speaker, Mr. Andrew Young, who will be speaking on how strong ESG links to value creation in five essential ways. Andrew, on to you. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Ramesh. And uh, thanks, Girish. That was, a, that was a great presentation. Very interesting. And uh, yeah, thanks to, to the chamber and for uh, everyone attending today. Uh, so my name is Andrew. Uh, I'll be talking about uh, how strong ESG links to value creation. Um, so you know, when I was asked to, to attend and, and speak at the webinar, I thought, you know, I thought about it in some detail. Uh, what should I talk about? ESG is a new catchphrase. Um, it's very much a hot topic. Um, and the clients I talk to, at least around the region, a lot of them seem quite confused about 
what it really is, what it means for them as a firm, and what benefits can it actually bring to them. So I thought today I would speak very practically uh, about some of the key themes uh, as they re relate mainly to private sector, but also to, to government. And, uh, what benefits uh, they are seeing from adopting strong ESG. So can we move to the next slide? That's a little bit about um, my company and what we're doing. So we're, we're Asian focused. We have offices across APAC. We've been operating for about 20 years in the environment space. Um, we work with global corporates, um, Asian listed corporates, uh, government, private and uh, multilateral agencies across Asia. So, you know, across a range of industries, we've got big growth in the tech sector. So we can count Zoom as our client. We can count Facebook. I think we're streaming on both of those today. We can count Google, uh, Microsoft, Amazon, uh, you know, all the way back across to oil and gas. Uh, we work with Petronas, for example. Uh, we work with Exxon and Shell. So we work across a whole range of, of different industries and, and sectors in Asia. So I, I hope I can bring some of those insights that we're seeing to our discussion today. Uh, can we go to the next slide? Um, we also offer, operate around the world. Um, we have about 5,000 staff, 180 offices. Um, I'll sit on the board of directors of our, of our global organization. So yeah, some of the examples I'm, I'm bringing today are also from our, from our global footprint. Next slide, please. So we get into the meat of the subject. ESG, materiality and value creation is our title. So ESG, environment, social governance. It's a new topic, been around for, for maybe two years, I guess. Um, started to be coined about two, three years ago. I think before that, you know, we all knew about CSR. I think before that, maybe we were all tree huggers. Uh, you know, interested primarily in, in the environment space. So these things have grown uh, very much driven by, by private sector and, and government at the same time. Uh, and I think a lot of it was driven, I would say, out of the oil and gas sector and the way that they manage their assets. Um, if you look historically, um, you know, nasty chemicals, heavy processes have a tendency to blow up. And when they blow up, they tend to kill people. Um, they tend to prevent that asset from, from operating. So there's no cash coming out of that company. Um, so, you know, in the oil and gas sector, they started thinking about the environment. They started thinking about safety a long time ago. And governance came along with that. You know, it's not just about looking at these aspects. It's how do you manage these aspects? And how do you measure these aspects and act upon the indicators coming out to ensure that, you know, these risks are managed? So ESG in, in the private sector, grew out of that space and a lot of things got taken on in that journey. Um, can we go to the next slide? So these are the key themes uh, that we look at in ESG uh, in a practical uh, basis. So on the environment these days we have building standards. There's lots and lots of green building standards out there. Uh, a lot of companies and developers particularly are selling you know, office space for example at a premium in buildings which have platinum ranking according to you know, different schemes and so forth. That's really taken off in the region. And, you know, and, and they're getting plenty of benefits out of that. Um, not just the, the rental, but also reduced operating costs. And we'll talk about that a little bit through the presentation. Um, of course, carbon emissions. Uh, you know, the latest um, meeting is coming up in, in Glasgow. It's a hot topic. Um, I saw an article the other day you know, saying that I think 60% of the world's known fossil fuel reserves need to stay in the ground if we're going to meet our 1.5 degree target. Um, tall order, um, but it brings carbon emissions into, into focus. Uh, we all generate those in our daily lives and into our business. Then energy consumption, energy efficient systems, uh, environmental management, um, land and, and biodiversity is also a hot topic from an environmental perspective. Uh, waste, uh, water are, are key issues, and we'll be talking about those a little bit through the presentation as well. So the resources we use, you know, in our in our daily lives and, and, and to manufacture the, our products, um, 
that we, that we, you know, that we sell, all this becomes important and really encompassed by the environmental theme. Um, we, we cover social and governance as well. So social is about our stakeholders. Um, I saw an interesting article in, in, in the paper today. I saw Syme Darby's uh, share price has reduced by 10%. And that was primarily due to labor issues. Lack of um, labor coming into, into Malaysia to, to work on their plantations, but also because the US had uh, slapped a bunch of fines on them, um, primarily stating that they used forced labor in their production. And so that's a social issue from a, from a company having a real world impact. Um, you know, measurable because share prices drop and it's linked to a particular aspect of their operation. But it comes back to ESG, it's a social thing. So social is about stakeholders about your employees, it's about uh, the, the people around the facility that you're using for your production or, or work, it's about your customers and clients, it's about your supply chains. Um, so there's a lot of aspects of social. Um, sorry, Andrew, could I just interrupt you here? You seem to be fading off in and out. Could you maybe get closer to your laptop and that might help? Uh, sure, Ramesh, uh, just, just ping me if it happens again, I'm sorry. Okay, that's fine. You, you're clear now. Thank you. That's better, is it? All right. Yeah, I, I tend to move my hands around a lot and <laughs> maybe they get the way of the mic. Um, so then we come to governance. Um, governance, I think Girish gave a, you know, an interesting talk there on aspects of governance. Um, so I won't touch on that very much other than, um, you know, the management systems that are put in place to manage these themes are really very, very important comes to both identifying risk to your business and in managing those risks. Um, I, I, I think Sorry, that Andrew, you're still fading out. Yeah, I don't, I don't know what it is, Ramesh. Sometimes I have an issue with Zoom. I don't know if it's uh, Microsoft right, or... Okay. But uh, I'll, I'm, I'm talking loudly. I'll try and shout a bit more. Um, yes, please. Can we have the next slide? <clears throat> so links to, to value creation. So as I said, I wanted to keep this um, as, as, as practical as, as, as possible to take these quite complex themes. There's lots and lots of themes. You know, it, it can seem quite, um, quite burdensome to, to think about you know, each of these different ones and what do they mean to me and bring them into focus through these five key aspects. So what ESG can do for me, um, it can generate top line growth. So by implementing ESG, you can generate sales or you can create a competitive edge for your company to generate top line growth. Um, by focusing on, on resources, waste minimization, you can lead to cost reductions in, in, in production and operation. Through better management of you know, your regulatory processes, ensuring that you have legal compliance and so on. Um, you can improve your reputation with the government. And this can lead to, I mean, this, this better organization or, you know, in, in new assets. Looking at how your asset interacts with the environment can be very important to your forward cash flow. I mean, I mean, Good example from here is you know we've been working with, with coca-cola globally and you know water supply is obviously very very important to them they need it to you know to produce their their, their drink and they often take the water from from the ground from groundwater so it's extracted by them and you know where they extract is often in competition with the local villages the other manufacturers using the water and so on. So knowing how your water resource works, how much you can take out and for how long is, is very, very important to that organization. So, I mean, it's, it's a very clear example of how looking at the environment can lead to long-term sustainability for your business. So these are the five key themes. Uh, now for the next set of slides, we'll run through some practical examples of, of each of these themes. And we'll, we'll finish up with a summary and uh, any, any Q&A later. So next slide. Uh, 
Uh, I think it's got some animation. So if you can bring up the, the slide. I'm just bringing up the, all the pictures. Okay. So th this is, oh, we're using the, the old slide deck. Sorry, I, I forgot to update you with a new slide deck, but this is, this is okay. Um, so we've been doing a lot of work with, with, with data centers over the last uh, few years. They've seen quite rapid growth. Um, so this example is from a company called Digital Realty. Um, my other example is from a, from a company called Equinix. Um, but we're also working with, with Microsoft data centers, for example, as well as Amazon data centers. Um, so this company, Digital Realty, they spotted a space in the market. They were noticing that their clients, which are Google, Microsoft, Facebook, other tier one companies buying most of the space in their data centers. You know, they, they, they noticed that their clients were demanding uh, strong ESG in their suppliers, not just um, other data center suppliers, for them, but, but across their entire supply chain. I mean, if you look at Apple, you look at Microsoft, they have big you know, um, global commitments to go zero carbon by 2030. Uh, and that's across their entire supply chain. So Digital Realty was one of the first um, data center suppliers to notice that about their clients. Uh, and the clients were very much focused on the manufacturing supply chains first. So digital realty, you know, they grew up a very strong ESG position. <clears throat> they were, uh, they, they focused on, on carbon, they focused on reporting, they focused on um, what you call PUE, which is the energy efficiency of, of data centers. <clears throat> you know, they, they, they use green building standards, for example, to be able to communicate that out, outwardly. They used environmental reporting to communicate that with their clients. And they began to follow their clients around the world. So, you know, now Digital Realty from being an American focused company now operate across the world, uh, 24 countries, and 291 data centers. So they've grown significantly, their, their top line by acceding to their clients' demand. So they were seeing their clients' demands for ESG. They developed it internally. They saw benefits from, the, from working that internally through cost savings, but they used those findings, those cost savings, those reductions in carbon to communicate to their clients they had strong ESG. And this led to the market growth for digital reality. Can we have the next slide? I think I'm, I'm missing a slide here, Ramesh, but uh, anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll carry on, here we are. Um, so th this example um, is from, this is an Ernst & Young Consumer Index uh, for 2021. And you know, they went out to uh, do a survey of consumers across, I think, America, Europe, and, and Asia, I looked at key cities across the world just asking basic questions, how do consumers buy, buy their product? How do they choose what they buy? And you, know, you can see from this, from this pie chart. So experience comes first. I mean, for most of us, we like to buy our products. You know, um, generally, you know, I don't know if my wife buys shampoo, she, she buys the nice shampoo she thinks has the best, uh, uh, best feeling for her hair. Um, you know, if there's a choice between one which has some kind of a statement on it which says, you know, we are socially friendly, you know, we pay fair labor, or we're environmentally friendly, then that would be number two or, or number three on, on her decision making. So when it, when it comes to consumers, um, you know, the, the E, the environment is not number one, but I mean, it's a good number two or number three in their decision making. So if you know, I'm a consumer product manufacturer of any kind, and I want to look at, you know, maximizing my, my market share, my growth. Why do I not use the environment as, as a marketing tool? So of course, I need to do the environment behind the scenes. I need to look at my production. I need to 
the chemicals that go in and the resources that go in. But if I can get some kind of certification and I can use that, then to put it on my, my bottle of shampoo and I can grow my market share. Right? And there are good examples of, 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 of you know, products and, and services which have, which have done this. Um, you know, and, and a good one would be um, you know, looking at Unilever. Uh, so Unilever have a, what they call their, their sustain, sustainable living brands you know, against their standard brands where they don't really use you know, the environment as a marketing tool. And those brands which use their sustainable living uh, marketing grew at 40, 46% faster than the rest of the business. They also delivered 70% of its turnover growth. So that's significant. Okay. I mean, that's, 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 that's very, very significant. And, you know, to take it down to the Malaysian examples, you know, we've been working for, for a number of companies in Malaysia looking at exporting to, to Europe or, or maintaining their exports to Europe. And they've been looking at their carbon footprint of their products and looking to reduce the carbon footprint of their products, you know, primarily to meet the, the new or the incoming EC regulations around carbon footprinting, but also as a marketing tool to grow their, their business. They see their competitors doing it and they think they need to do it also. So, you know, ESG, if used in the right way, done for the right reasons can lead to top line growth. Uh, next slide, please. So the next theme, cost reductions. Can we just clip through the animation? So it comes up. <clears throat> All right, so this is, um, I think it's Intel is it in Malaysia. So cost reductions. Yeah, this is, this is Intel Malaysia. So if I'm looking at environment as a theme for my organization, I can look internally and you know, I can look, okay, where do I use resources? What is my environmental footprint? And I'll use electricity in my manufacturing process or in my office. I'll use water, I'll use raw materials. And you know, what doesn't get used to, to make my products or to, to run my office? will go as waste, okay, and waste gets thrown away. So I'm buying this raw material in the first place, and then I'm paying some guy to cut it off and dispose of it afterwards. So there's a, there's a cost to me there. So I can, I can look at that, and I can look at that in terms of efficiency, and I can assess where we can make savings you know, in that manufacturing process. And you know, more often than not, there are, there are low hanging fruits there to, you know, to identify. They just haven't been looked at before through this lens. And once you start looking through this environmental lens, you can start to see these low hanging fruits and say, hey, you know, why don't we do this? Or why don't we try that? And, and, and significant savings can, can be found very often. Um, so this is Intel Malaysia. Um, they were using a lot of energy. They had rooftop space. They felt that I mean, they have significant rooftop space, okay? Um, to use there, so someone had the bright idea of installing solar. So now 6,000 megawatts of electricity are produced annually. Uh, it reduces carbon dioxide emissions by, by 3,800 tons, which is a significant saving. So, um, you know, what, what does that do for them? So, I mean, 6,000 6, megawatts of electricity, um, I, I, I to get the price in Malaysia at the moment, but you know this this is this is a significant amount of cash, right? It's about half a million ringgit, a million ringgit annually. Okay, three thousand eight hundred tons of carbon dioxide is it's a significant amount. I mean, once you install renewable energy, um, you can generate these things called carbon offsets. Um, they can be sold per ton. They can be certified and sold. Um, you know, in Singapore, you can get twenty dollars a ton for one of these. Uh, I think in Malaysia, the price is maybe about seven or eight dollars per ton at the moment. So it's another, you've got, you've got a cost saving and you've got a source of revenue. And everyone feels good about solar energy. So this was a significant um, cost saving for, for Intel in this basis. And generally an investment like this at the moment, 
um, payback can be three to four years. Okay, next slide, please. So an, a, another aspect of um, you know, using ESG, reduce regulatory and, and legal interventions. So once you start having a formal you know, environment, uh, social governance scheme in place, you, know, you do look at the regulations. One of the requirements would primarily be meeting local regulations and being able to demonstrate. So importantly, being able to demonstrate compliance with local regulations. And this can lead to a much better and firmer relationship with, with you know, regulatory bodies, which can um, you know, reduce the oversight you can, you can gain from, 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 uh, from regulatory agencies. So we mentioned just now, um, you know, the, um, the Syme Derby, um, the same Derby example of losing 10% on their, on their share price, primarily due to, um, you know, US regulations in this case. So they're, they're exporting to the US. Um, certainly their, you know, communication, I mean, I, I, you know, in this presentation, I'm not going to make any, any judgments on, on Syme Derby internally. Certainly there was, a, there was a loss of communication there between the company and the, and the US authorities. Somehow or somewhere that broke down, and you know this sort of issue can be identified early, and can be, you know, resolved before it reaches these kinds of decisions. When you have better relations with government authorities, um, on, on the plus side, you know there are schemes out there. So, so in Malaysia we have this green technology financing scheme. Um, there's a green building scheme. Uh, you know you want to turn your your your, your building green. Um, there, there, there are grants, there are tax breaks and so on available. So on, on the plus side, once I start, you know, if I've got a formal ESG scheme in place in my country, that scheme and the governance of that scheme will also help to identify opportunities for this sort of thing as well. When we're not focused on these aspects, generally we won't see these opportunities. And if we do, we won't really know how to grasp them and so having a formal ESG system in place can help to, to, to you know, grasp these opportunities, for, well, identify and grasp these opportunities. So overall, you know, I can make my business more competitive. Um, can we have the next slide, please? A um, couple more examples of regulatory and legal interventions. So the bottom left one, um, the last year, a few years ago, the illegal dumping in, in, in Johor. I think there was a cost of, of, of cleanup in that case of around, um, I think it was about 20 to 40 tons of, of chemical waste with a cost of, of more than 10 million ringgit to clean it up. So you know, I don't know how much savings that company made by just dumping this waste down there, you know, at some point in time, you're going to get caught. And when you do, if you're faced with cleanup costs, they are significant and, and greater than 10 million ringgit you know, in this case. Um, so having an ESG program you know, in place, you know, we talked earlier about ensuring compliance with regulations and being able to demonstrate compliance with regulation is really important if these risks are present. You know, the example on, on the left there is, is Nestle. Um, they were fined for really, you know, releasing industrial effluent above acceptable standards. Shouldn't have happened. Um, big company, they can still make mistakes. You know, maybe the environmental program in there wasn't as strong or robust as it should have been. Um, maybe they hadn't identified the risks in, in the effluent itself and in the effluent treatment that should have been identified early on. Or, or possibly they weren't having a good relationship with the, with, with the regulators. You know, whichever of those it was, it resulted in quite a significant fine in this case and a loss of reputation. Um, can we move to the next slide? So productivity uplift. Um, 
again, um, I, I need to apologize because I've actually updated these slides and I've, I've forgotten to send them to you, Ramesh. So my apologies, but um, I'll, I'll talk to this one. So ESG, what we, you know, the things we spoke about so far, um, top line growth, um, resource efficiency, you know, compliance with regulations and so on. So when we look at resource efficiency and top line growth, um, you know, if we work on both of these, it, it can lead to productivity uplift. Okay, you know, reducing the raw materials I'm using and the energy I'm using per product that I manufacture will, in, will, will lead to productivity gains for me. That can give me a competitive advantage to my, you know, to, to, my, to my competitors. Um, the example I've used here is more around the, the social. Uh, I've used uh, Do a Farmer. <clears throat> so they, they've invested very, very heavily in, in, in training programs for their employees, uh, reward programs for their employees. Um, they've won a bunch of awards and so on. So th this is part of the social. This is identifying their stakeholders and they looked at their employees as, as, as key stakeholders. It takes a lot of, to, to train these people. You know, they want to keep them for as long as possible. Because um, replacing employees <clears throat> costs a lot of money, both in terms of the actual changeover as well as training them up again. Um, and you know, if you look at the graphs at the bottom, you can see that there is significant retention of, of new talent or, or a reduction in the new talent, if you like, across the across the organization. They've, they've invested in, in the human resources programs. They've identified that as a key thing for their competitive advantage. It comes under the S part of the ESG, and they've improved their employee engage, engagement to, to 91%, and they've improved, the, improved their employee retention significantly, which has led to significant productivity uplift for them. Uh, can we go to the next slide? Um, oh, this is one of the ones I was going to take out. <laughs> so um, this one is looking at Top Glove. Again, it comes back to the forced labor allegations. Um, we saw the outcome on, on, on Slime Derby and, and what that meant to their, to their share price, their share price when, the, when the US regulators made that judgment call on, on, on Slime Derby. Um, if we look at Top Glove, similar. Similar outcome for them, uh, again, related to the social aspect, again, related to, to the HR aspect and, and management of, of their employees um, can lead to real world problems with, with, with businesses. Can we go to the next slide? Okay. So, so this one is, is, is asset um, investment and, and asset optimization. Um, okay, so okay, I, I, my, my, my example I, I want to talk about with this. So in investment and asset optimization, what does it actually mean? Uh, it, it means taking account of, of, of your assets and the environment around you. Okay. I mean, a very real world practical example, I was talking to a, to a landowner um, just last week ways they've got a lot of land but we were talking particularly about um i think it's a 600 hectare block of land and um this this land had been earmarked for um tourism uh, it's in a nice spot uh good location um but with covid and and, and various other factors you know tourism is, is is off the guard so we have an environmental factor which is impacting what you could possibly do with this land. And, um, you know, we, we've seen the growth of renewable energy. So this, this landowner was looking at using this asset or optimizing this asset by changing the investment from, from tourism across to solar energy and looking at, you know, building a 600 megawatt solar farm on this, on this piece of land. So it's a change of the environmental parameters 
in this case, COVID, has, has impacted uh, a potential business plan. What can we do with that asset? You know, other real world examples. Um, Five minute mark, Andrew. Okay, am I, you want me to come to the end, Ramesh? Five more minutes, please. Sure, sure. Um, yeah, in this example here, you know, we, we've um, identified Petronas. I mean, they're teaming up with, with Enios to um, develop clean hydrogen supply. And, you know, we've looked, we've seen technologies growing in, in the North Sea of England. I presume similar technologies will be taken across to, to try out on the platforms in Malaysia. It's using uh, wave power, actually, around the platform. So renewable energy to, to remove the hydrogen from, from gas and, and generate um, clean hydrogen in, in that way. Um, so they're teaming up to do that. Um, they've identified in the longer term that they need to make a change. They see the market changing and they're, they're, they're adapting to it. You know, the, the other examples I, I would give around water. Uh, over the past few years, we've been doing a lot of work with tobacco companies in Malaysia as well as uh, Indonesia, India particularly. Um, they use a lot of water in the, I mean, to both to grow the tobacco plants and, and manufacture the, the cigarettes. And we've been doing a lot of work with them around water stewardship. Again, looking at the water resources, looking at what they need to extract you know, today, how they can minimize that moving forward, how much water resources are available to them moving forward so that they can really look at you know, their manufacturing processes and really look at optimizing that asset over time based upon the availability of the natural resources. And you know, with, with climate changing effects, those water resources, will, they will change. And that be, was part of our study. You know, and these companies are looking 5, 10, 15, 20 years into the future to, to maximize and optimize the, out, the outputs from, from their natural assets. Uh, can we go to the next slide? So this is my summary slide. Um, so on the left hand there, we've got top line growth, cost reductions, regulatory and legal interventions, <coughs> productivity uplift, and investment and asset optimization. So these are five key things, five key rewards that, that corporates can get for implementing ESG. You know, I, I won't sit here and say all of these will be available to every single organization, but certainly, you know, my company ESC has advise corporations across a whole range of industries and certainly you know one two or three of these will land on your doorstep and would be considered low-hanging fruit to be you know to be gained from your operations if you begin to look at ESG in a more consistent and comprehensive way so with that uh, Ramesh I know my time's up uh, I hope I didn't cut out too much there but thank you very much Thank you, Andrew. Yes, just, just, just some time and thank you for that excellent presentation. Uh, a lot of practical examples, uh, of course, minus a little bit of the technical hitch, but uh, we've had you shouting for 20 minutes, so we're quite happy about that. Hopefully that isn't an environmental problem. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce Mr. M. R. Chandran, who will be speaking to you on sustainability threats for the Malaysian agricultural industry. Mr. Chandran. Uh, thank you, um, Ramesh, for that introduction. And uh, good, good afternoon, good evening, uh, participants. Uh, good to see there are a few uh, Victorians still on the line, and it must be your dinner time. So appropriate to speak about agriculture. Um, but I will be concentrating more on the oil palm industry. You have already heard comments from the previous two speakers. Uh, they, social impact on the industry and what has transpired over the last year or so with uh, severe sanctions by the CBP in the United States. I, I won't go into too much of details, but I want to give you a very broad picture of uh, agriculture as such. Um, uh, can, can we go to the next slide, please? Uh, I want to give you the big picture because um, people still 
treat agriculture as old economy. Now, what do you mean by old economy? Old economy means basically poor economic earnings, uh, poor technology adoption, uh, intense labor-based production, and uh, low manpower development. Uh, but what the population tend to forget is the, the food and nutrition technology uh, security is the backbone of that is agriculture. And if you take into consideration that last year, Malaysia's import bill was close to 56 billion ringgit. And it has been rising by four to five billion every year. And this is in spite of the pandemic. Our import bill was 56 billion, billion last year. So let me give you the big picture about agriculture, then I will move into the oil palm industry uh, as such. Okay, next slide. Okay, look at the uh, segment on the left. This is the global land use. And what you see here is that the total global land area is 13. 0.4 billion hectares. I've converted into hectares, so it's easier to understand. You know? Now, of this 13.4, about 37% is agricultural land. In other words, close to about one third of it is agricultural land. So you have out there 5 billion hectares. Now, of this 5 billion hectares, can you have the next click? Oh, something went wrong here. Um, you can't show that pie chart? No, uh, something is overlapping. Okay, what I wanted to show you was of this 5 billion hectares, two thirds is pasture land. And one third, when, when I talk about pasture, it means grazing, cattle grazing. So the animal husbandry takes up two thirds of that and only one third of 5 billion is uh, agricultural crops. Now of that one third agricultural crops, you can see the global oil palm cultivated area is around 27 million hectares and Indonesia accounts for 17 million and Malaysia 6 million. And of course the rest of it is in Thailand, Africa, and South America. Next one, next slide. Right, the FAO has estimated that we will be requiring 70% more food by 2050. But the question is, where is this going to come from? You, I just want to give you an analysis of oils and fats. Now that includes animal fats as well. If you look at the uh, consumption pattern of oils and fats on a per capita basis, it has moved from 14.8 kilograms in 1988 to 20 or 29 or 30 kilograms in 2018, in 30 years. It has doubled, slightly more than doubled. And the estimate is that to move to 37.5 kilograms per capita. And remember this, oils and fats constitute the total calorie intake per day. And an average adult, the intake is about 2000 kilograms. So that translates to 44 to 77 grams of oils and fats. Now, what I want you to look at again, you look at the over the last three decades, that is from 1988 to 20, uh, 2018, the population has grown from 5 billion to 7.78 billion. 
an increase of 2.8, but the middle class has grown by 2 billion. Now, there are enough studies to show that as your income levels arise, the consumption of meat or cigarettes also increases proportionately. So this is where the food security issue is going to arise, simply because there are not enough of arable land around to increase production. Productivity of many of the crops have reached a plateau. Of course, with the genetic modification, there are some increases in productivity, but then there are very many countries like Europe and even Australia who are not really in favor of genetic modification. So we have challenges ahead. And then coupled with all that is climate change. Next slide. Now, this is the cultivated land area in Malaysia as of 2018. The total land area of Malaysia is 33 million hectares, of which 8 million hectares is cultivated. Of that 8 million hectares, you can see oil palm accounts for 73% and rubber takes up 14. In other words, 87% are under tree crops of the total cultivated land. Then we have paddy at 9%, fruits and vegetables at 2%, and others like horticulture, aquaculture, et cetera, another 2%. Now of the total land area of nearly 33 million, the forest cover is around 56. Well, it's down to about 54 million, 54%, uh, sorry. And now uh, the latest figure, um, but what is of interest here is that of the total land area, oil palm constitutes 18, rubber three, paddy two, and other crop. But look at other lands, 20%. In other words, about six million, six and a half million hectares is basically townships, industrial, commercial, and housing. And of course, parks and uh, golf courses and everything else. Next. Now, the impact of on oil palm cultivation, it is predominantly in the tropics, but the message is that it should not negatively impact the biodiversity, both plant and animal life. But if you look at the number of species per of plants per 10,000 kilometers, you'll realize that if you just look at Malaysia and Indonesia here and Papua New Guinea, you can see how rich the biodiversity is. You're looking at nearly four to 5,000 uh, species in this area. Then you move on to Africa, again, where oil palm is grown in Nigeria, Côte d'Ivoire, uh, Congo, etc. Again, rich in biodiversity. And then move on to South America, Brazil, Colombia, Ecuador, Honduras, etc. You also have rich biodiversity. Next slide. Now, this is where oil palm grows best. 10 degrees north and 10 degrees south of the equator. Now, this is the tropical belt, as it is called. And here you can see the poverty line. Because this is important. The reason I'm showing this is how oil palm and other crops, of course, have uplifted poverty. And Malaysia is a classic example. You know, in the 1960s, our poverty was around 50%. Today, it's only around less than 5%. As a result of the income generated from crops like rubber, oil palm, cocoa, coffee, and others. Now, if you look at Indonesia, Sumatra, Kalimantan, uh, Sulawesi, uh, and Papua, 
you find that the poverty is around between 10 to 20 percent, where Malaysia is well below the 10 percent mark. Now, the same applies, but move on to Africa, where oil palm is also grown, along with other crops like tea and coffee and cocoa, etc. But look at their poverty lines, about 30 to 50 percent in countries like this. I mean, these are the Congo, Nigeria, Liberia, Gabon, uh, Gabon, sorry, uh, Cameroon, Ivory Coast. And, and this is where the tropical crops are grown, but look at their poverty level. They have not achieved the same success as it has been done in Southeast Asia. And there are reasons for it. And yet all these crops originated from Africa or from South America. And you move on to South America, you can see uh, countries like Brazil, which is a major agricultural producer, but still the poverty is around 30%. Next slide. Now the global demand for vegetable oils. There are something like 16 vegetable oils out there in the world market, but the predominant ones that are traded are four oil palm, soybean oil, rapeseed or mustard seed. Uh, again, in Australia and Canada, uh, they have a different variety of rapeseed and it's called canola oil, but the same species. And of course, sunflower. And uh, these dominate the world uh, production and trade. And you can see the production, the demand trend has grown for oil palm from in 2004, which is 15 years ago, 16 years ago, <clears throat> about 32, 33 million tons, all the way to 75, 74 million tons. And you can see the growth in soybean as well, to 55 million. Then, of course, you have the rapeseed growth, not so much because rapeseed is predominantly grown in Europe. And of course, the, the other variety is the mustard seed, which is grown in India. And of course, canola, which is in Canada and Australia. And of course, sunflower, a highly uh, valuable oil which is predominantly grown in Russia and Eastern Europe, especially in Ukraine, uh, which has grown uh, slightly because there has not been any land expansion. Next slide, please. Now, why is palm oil so popular? It's the biological advantage of the oil palm tree. And remember this, the oil palm is a perennial crop unlike rapeseed, sunflower, and soybean, which are annual crops. And if you look at it, to produce one ton of oil, palm oil requires only 0.26 hectares, whereas rapeseed will require 1.25 or nearly six times more, <clears throat> and sunflower will require 1.4 or nearly seven times more, and soybean will require two hectares or eight times more. So this is the critical biological advantage oil palm has over other annual policy crops. Now look at the demand scenario for oil, palm oil, or rather vegetable oils, all the vegetable oils. Today, the total vegetable oil production as at end of last year was 165 million tons. That's what the world consumed. This is forecast to move to 305 million tons by FAO. Now, here, if you look at the land allocated for oil seed crops, including oil palm, it is 35% is allocated for all the oil seed crops in the world. And only 10% is oil palm, and yet it produces 35% of all the vegetable oils using less than 10% of the land. Again, as I mentioned earlier, because of the productivity factor where the average yield is four tons of oil uh, per hectare, 
whereas all the others are around anything from half a ton to one ton of oil. Next slide. Some facts. Well, this is an issue uh, which is raised by environmentalists, but sometimes the difference between the narrative and the data. Uh, this is why I'm data driven. Um, so I like to stick to data and facts and not narratives on there because narratives become an emotional issue. If you look at the last 150 50 years, 27 million hectares have been planted with oil palms globally, as I mentioned earlier. Now, much of this has been converted from other tree crops, especially in Indonesia and Malaysia, from rubber to oil palm. Now, in the last 10 years, 15 million hectares of soil have been planted just in Brazil and Argentina. And every year, plus or minus 11 million hectares of forests are cleared globally. And 2.7 million hectares of forests are cleared just for cattle farming, mainly in South America. Now, if you want to support sustainability and focus should be on raising yields and not land expansion. Next slide. Yes, the palm oil industry, there are 4 million smallholders, don't forget, and about 2 million plus employees around the world. And remember this in terms of um, Area is concerned, Indonesia is 80%, and Thailand, 50% of the smallholders, and Malaysia, 40% of the smallholders sector. That's huge, the smallholder sector, although people tend to associate and say it's dominated by the plantation. Yes, very much in the Malaysian success story is because of the corporate agriculture. Uh, sector, but in Indonesia and Thailand, it's very much smallholder driven. And in terms of SDGs, out of the 17 SDGs, the oil palm industry supports uh, 11 of them. And the overriding goal here is to ensure that no one is left behind, and that includes the poor. And as I said, mentioned earlier, it has uplifted uh, the poor in this country, and so much so our poverty level is well below 5%. Next. Now, why does ESG matter to plantation business? Next slide. In 1970, this is interesting, Nobel laureate Milton Friedman wrote there is one and only one social responsibility of business to use its resources and engage in activities designed to increase its profits. Of course, he went on to say, so long as it stays within the rules of the game. But 50 years on, few could have imagined how the world has changed. Today, businesses confront rapidly growing movements advocating that they also focus on promoting desirable outcomes relating to ESG and climate change objectives in addition to profit. And this is where the three pillars of sustainability come into play, people, planet, and profit in that order. Next slide. Uh, five minutes, Mr. Chandran, thank you. Oh, okay. Uh, they, now, even our Bursa Malaysia, which has been alluded to earlier by Girish, and look what he had to say. He said it sounded like a nebulous idea, ESG, but it's real. We see the FTSE for Good Bursa index growing. We see sustainable assets outperforming. Next slide. So the sustainability criteria, things have changed within the world of sustainability. 
Now, the scrutiny by financial institutions and NGOs are now more intense than ever before. But the most two important virtues to uphold of any sustainability scheme are integrity and credibility. Next. So I think you all know this pictures, very familiar with these images out there with, with respect to oil palm. But what is interesting is the bottom right, you look at all these spreads, there are 1,600 plus products in Europe alone, which carry the label palm oil free or free from palm oil or no palm oil labels. Next. Yes, you look at all these brands, these are global brands and the image is this, the orangutan, destruction of the orangutan's habitat. Next. Yes, deforestation is a burning issue. Next. Next one. Okay. I have always reckoned that ESG should really be described as GSC. Because to me, governance is the first important criteria. Next. Firstly, I would look at the board of directors, especially at the independent directors. Next. So ask yourself this question, are these directors truly independent and does their personal reputation depend on how the company behaves? Next. If the company's directors are in good public standing, they're not going to risk their reputation by being associated with the business, which is engaged in dodgy or unacceptable practices. Their reputation is on the line. Next. So the bottom line is investors should remember that a good board is the key to good governance. Next. ESG ratings to me are only the starting point and not entirely reflective of companies' actual performance. They are more a reflection of companies' progress and furnishing the right information and ticking the right boxes convincingly. Next. So while there are several ESG ratings out there, it is difficult to harmonize these standards due to lack of alignment on how ESG is being evaluated globally. So most people are struggling to sift through ESG data that is reported, but it helps to identify few credible shortcuts that provide some ability for comparison of companies. Next. Can you just click on? Now, I would recommend fund managers to get a clear picture of the actual performance and company strength in the area of ESG, they need to keep engaged with the company's senior management. Next. Local investors should be, have a better understanding of the sector. Next. Now the perception that palm oil sector is being controversial is not helpful. So if you're looking for good companies to invest in, as well as to palm oil companies that might have excellent potential, but are overlooked by investors because of negative perception. Earlier speakers uh, have alluded to the Saim Dhabi issue, how, why the market dipped by nearly 9% yesterday. Next. Local investors should be less biased. Next. Optics are bad. The action by the US control the, the Customs Border Patrol to issue a withhold release order on palm products on two large listed Malaysian companies has inflated the perception, misperception, that the OP industry here is fraught with labor issues. Allegations of forced labor under the ILO's 11 indicators. I mean, this is a laborious subject, which I can't go into at that moment, what this higher relevant indicators are. I'll leave that for another occasion. Next. Labor practices may have to be constantly audited. That's what I would say. Next. Can go on next one. So 
it would be necessary for planters to engage independent third party consultants to audit their labor and social issues. Next. Next. So what are the key trends to watch regarding ESG issues? And keep a close watch out on certification reports, pre-ILO forced labor. The certification bodies or auditors need to a stringent audit process and massive change in attitude toward the industry is required. Failure to rise to this challenge will over the next few years lead to Southeast Asian palm products being embargoed throughout the developed world. US is already there. Canada and EU is fast developing similar systems and UK, Australia, and New Zealand are bound to follow. So the Malaysian Code of Corporate Governance is putting more responsibility on boards to embrace ESG. No longer just the responsibility of the Sustainability Committee. committee. So all listed companies will have to step up. Next. With that, I thank you for listening. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Ramesh. Thank you very much for that uh, presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, we've heard from our three panelists on what ESG is all about, why Malaysian businesses must adopt ESG, and how your company can adopt ESG as part of your corporate structure. And we've also heard about the problems associated with ESG compliance. The environment has been an important concern of the 21st century. Social impact has come into prominence lately and is an integral part of the ESG framework and governance. There are two parts to this criteria. One is staying ahead of violations, ensuring transparency and industry practices. The other is the internal system of controls, practices and procedures to govern. This new phenomenon has quite a way to go, but adopted we must. The questions that arise immediately are, who should adopt ESG? Well, there's a timeline. How do we go about introducing ESG into our corporate structure? And of course, the cost indicators. The Q&A session will hopefully clear the air. And on that note, could I pose the first question, which is, is investing in ESG a current requirement for SMEs, more so the medium-sized companies? And would ESG be more a requirement for the larger scale cooperation at the present time. Could I request uh, Mr. Girish Ramachandran perhaps to take that question? Is investing in ESG a current requirement for SMEs or is it more for the larger scale corporations at the current time? Yeah, I think, I think uh, this, this is a great question, right? Um, anything to do with the cost implication um, it's going to be very difficult for SMEs to absorb and, and carry something through. We see this in digital transformation as well. If they cannot uh, understand the financial benefits of investing in technology, they, they will just not proceed. Uh, but that means other people may, may move ahead and take over uh, their share of the market with better productivity and cost. So to me, I'd, I'd, I'd probably like to look at it a bit differently. I don't think anything that uh, we've been talking about here, spoken by all the other speakers um, and yourself, Ramesh, is something that is not ingrained in us, yeah? In, in 27 Group, our tagline is rebuilding humanity, yeah? And to me, it comes back to everything in ESG, SDGs, is about humanity. How do we, how do we not destroy the earth and, and have more greed. You know, how do we do the right thing? You know, it's not, it's not new things. It's just going back to individuals. So to me, yes, SMEs should start with ESG and maybe they will be able to differentiate themselves from the larger corporations who may have ILO issues and so on. So I think, I think there is huge opportunity to, to leverage of it, but it is not whitewashing your annual reports or your websites. You got to practice it and, and you can see that people can assess your level of ESG from what you do and your actions. 
Thank you, uh, Girish, for that. Uh, next question, ladies and gentlemen, would it be a good idea to provide a course on ESG or SDG to be conducted for all directors of companies and made a requirement for those sitting on a board of a certain size? Uh, Mr. Chandran, could I ask you for to answer that, please? I, I, I think that is a very good question, actually. Um, in fact, interestingly, uh, I'm a mentor in the 30% club for women directors on board. And uh, one of the things that we do focus on is the knowledge on ESG and SDG for potential uh, directors. You know? So I think Bursa, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Securities Commission and Bursa Malaysia have conducted courses on this uh, for uh, independent directors and others as well, but not as intensive uh, as it should be, because I think ESG came into focus in the last couple of years. Therefore, I think it's a very pertinent question. And I think both uh, Versa and Securities Commission should be embarking on this and companies themselves as well for their own directors. Right. Thank you, Mr. Chandran, for that. If I can go to the next uh, question, please. Uh, first of all, it's a thanks to the speakers for a very informative session. Question, corporates are increasingly embracing and reporting ESG. Should government procedure, or oh, sorry, should government produce an annual report of the country's ESG performance, especially for us as a global trading nation and seeking FDI? It is the right thing to do and can be a competitive advantage. Andrew, can I ask you to take that, please? Um, <clears throat> thanks, Ramesh. I mean, that's an interesting question. Should government produce an annual report on, on a country's ESG performance? Yes. Um, you know, I, I would answer, I mean, my answer as a, as a greenie would be yes. Okay? And, I, and I think that um, we're, we're on the course to doing that right now, right? I mean, with, with the latest um, COP commitments which are going in now, I mean, I saw a league table the other day of, of countries and, and their different commitments they're making towards reduction in carbon. And I think there was only one country on the green list, which meant that their commitments um, met um, the requirement to keep carbon below the level needed for 1.5 degrees C. And that, that country was Namibia, which is <laughs> quite funny enough, right? And, uh, you know, there were, I think, four countries on the amber list, which were almost there, pretty good. UK was one of those. Um, I think France was one, I think primarily because of they use a lot of nuclear energy. But everyone else was on the nasty list. OK, <laughs> so. <laughs> so, look, I, mean, I think um, some kind of reporting is beginning to happen. I think it's a really good idea. And I do think that moving forward, um, it could be a competitive advantage to, to a country like Malaysia, you know, exporting globally. I, I do think it could be recognized. Thank you for that, uh, Andrew. A uh, question for Mr. M. R. Chandran specifically, with all this talk of sustainability and sustainable agriculture, a number of brands, especially the ones marketing food products, love to use the labels such as organic or pesticide free. Would you say such labels are genuine or just simple marketing strategies to trick consumers into feeling good about buying such products? <laughs> good question, Adam. Um, yes, I, if you want my personal view, um, I have my question marks when I see something labeled as organic. It all depends on the definition of organic. The USDA Department of Agriculture's old definition of organic was no use of pesticide or fertilizer for three consecutive years. So which means now you know why Philippines have capitalized on virgin organic coconut oil because their co coconut industry, there has been no investment and it is entirely owned by farmers except for few which are run as plantations. And of course, it has been neglected, but the marketing gimmick which they came out with was because these trees have not received any fertilizer and no pesticides, and you will know that uh, 
Ramesh very well. <laughs> and so they can term it as organic and also add the word virgin to it as virgin uh, coconut oil. And look at the premium that people are prepared to pay for that product. It is amazing. Yes, you are absolutely right. It is very much a marketing gimmick. When you look at the sales of fertilizers, and when you look at the cost increases of fertilizers, just in the last two years, I mean, it's been, in spite of the downturn in the economy, because of the pandemic, the fertilizer prices have shot right through the roof because there is a demand for it. And the same thing applies to pesticides. So who are this, maybe a niche market for, their, for those people who are prepared to pay 30 to 40% more for these sort of products. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chandran. Um, I'll go on to the next question. Is not all talk about ESG in Southeast Asia simply about greenwashing, no pun intended, I assume, with continuing prime focus on making as much money as fast as possible by any possible means? Um, any one of you? Uh, could I request to, to answer? Is it, is it not? Is it all talk? Is, is ESG all talk where Southeast Asia is concerned? Is it all about greenwashing? No, I, th I think I would uh, just jump in first and say that, you see, one must remember that uh, both, I think most Southeast Asian nations, except perhaps Indonesia, because by virtue of their 270 or 280 million people, uh, which has had a huge domestic market, all the others are trading nations. And if you are a trading nation, you have to abide by global principles. And you can't be greenwashing because the consumers in the developed world and the rest of it are going to call you out if you do that. Therefore, this is why you are seeing a lot of sustainability certification standards, especially voluntary certification standards. And you also have mandatory standards which are coming out by the governments of both Indonesia and Malaysia with ISPO and MSPO. Huh? So this is the way to go. This is the first step is to get your sustainability certification standards to avoid being labeled as greenwashing. And if you are a trading nation, people are going to watch you. You are on the, in the spotlight and you're not going to get away with it. Right. Um. Gurisho, Andrew, anything to add to that? Um, maybe I'll just add from a, from a corporate perspective as well. Um, just to say, I think if you look hard enough, I think you can find examples of both greenwashing and, and strong environmental commitment and, and gaining advantage from that. You know, a good example at the moment would be the energy transition, which, which is ongoing. I mean, there's a big, big drive towards renewable energy. You know, the price of solar has um, you know, reduced below the price of coal um, significantly. I mean, just in the last three years, I think you know, we've, we've permitted about three gigawatts of renewable energy in Southeast Asia, which is, I mean, these are real things happening. This is not greenwashing. Right. Okay. On, on the other side of the coin, you're gonna find those companies going out and, and, and chopping down the trees or, or, or throwing pollution into the river and, and you know, to save a buck. And you will still find that. Um, and, and they may have a stamp on, on the side of their, of their van doing it, right? Which says, hey, you know, we're good, whatever. So you can, I think you'll always find those examples, but I think the general trend is in the right direction at the moment. Right. Thank you, Andrew. Yurish, anything to add? Yeah, I think, I think um, the first point is for corporates and businesses, um, there's nothing wrong in making money. I mean, that is the intent of a business, isn't it? But but I think I think it is it is something that has probably gone the other way around, and that is why the emphasis has been brought back on ESG. You know, if if we weren't killing the planet, uh, taking carbon out of the earth, we would not need to have a focus. So I think this is just something that um, investors are starting to have a very strong feeling, and they're starting to put their money based on emotions. And this is the dangerous part because you can see fund managers 
moving funds all over the place and changing the perception of companies. So, so I think it's it's a bit late. It's a bit late in the day, but it's good that we're we're you know having a grip on it. Um, you know, I'd, I'd like to go back to one of the other questions, which um, um, one of the uh, audience asked, and should the government have a report on ESG on all the companies? I I think it should be the other way around. I think every company should have their own assessment of it and put it up on their website. You know, just like CSR, you know, you, you know, somebody donates 5,000 ringgit to a home. He's all over Facebook and he's on emails and so on. So why not, why not, you know, every company, every organization, even MABC, you know, you should have an ESG section on your website. What are you doing? You know, how much paper are you using? You know, uh, what's, what's that electricity footprint? It, it doesn't need to be big, but, but it starts with that. And, and let's start to have our own disclosures and educate people. You know, uh, there's only been, you know, 70 companies on Bursa that have a uh, ranking. This is crazy out of, you know, a thousand listed companies. So I think, I think it comes back to ourselves. And, and it is important. It is an important topic. Um, it's probably the most important strategy for Malaysia to get out of COVID. And, and bring investors back to create those jobs, to create the income, to, to you know, bring our Gini coefficient to, to something that's more realistic. Can I just add on to that, uh, Ramesh? Really? That question yes. that was asked, I think, uh, uh, by Mr. Nambia. Um, see, as I said in my earlier presentation, to me, governance is the most important factor in the ESG. Now, just give you an example, just look at the country down south of us. Why is Singapore rated by most of the global rating agencies as one of the top five? It boils down to governance at the government level. And I think that is what the question was about. You know, it's the government scorecard, so to speak. Uh, if the government is going to keep a scorecard, uh, in other words, an ESG scorecard, how would they rank? But I think their ratings agencies in the world are taking care of that because they themselves are giving a rating for, and they have their own methodologies, uh, ratings for the thing. So, but I think the point here is governance comes first. And if the country's governance at the both political and the economic level is addressed, then it will permeate down to the corporations and the society. But if governance is not up to the mark at the top level, then of course, a lot of people are not going to expect the same standards being adopted by companies. By companies. Right. Thank you, Mr. Chandran, for that. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we've come to almost the end of our webinar. And first of all, I think uh, all of you are with me when I say a big thank you to our panelists, Mr. Girish Ramachandran of the 27 Group, Mr. Andrew Young of ESC, and Mr. Emma Chandran of ERGA for the excellent discourse on the topic of ESG and why Malaysian businesses need to embrace it. On behalf of the MABC, I'd like to thank all the participating people in the webinar, and I look forward to seeing you all at the next one. If you do happen to have any more questions uh, which you would like the panelists to answer outside of this webinar, kindly send it to mabc at mabc.org.my and uh, we'll send it over to them and see if they can actually give you a explanation on any of the other questions that you've had and are unfortunately not able to be answered at this webinar. Once again, thank you all for participating. Please stay safe and for those in the office, have a safe journey home. Thank you all. And good evening. Thank you, Ramesh. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. See everyone.